Okay. All right, podcasters, welcome to today's show. All you newbies out there, we're glad to have you. And today on the podcast, we have Zoe Sandor. She's a certified professional dog trainer and owner of Pack Method Prep, San Diego's first, very first canine prep school. And along with Pack Method Prep, Zoe's also the founder of Zoe's Dog Training. And she has also starred in Animal Planet's Cat vs. Dog. Her passion for canine students is clear in her personal motto, Live Life, Train Dogs. You can learn more about Zoe and Pack Method Prep at packmethodprep.com and follow them on Instagram at packmethodprep. So Zoe, welcome to the show. Hi there. Happy to be here. So why don't you take a second to fill in anything I might have missed there and we'll get right into everything you do. No, you got it. That, that was it. Me in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. So walk us through the, the, the story of how you got to this point and what got you passionate about dogs and, and most of all about training them and, and making it into what you do now, which is a you know, big growing business. Oh, I love that. I love that question. So <laughs> what, what actually got me into it, if we go way back, is my um, my first dog. So I, you know, always wanted a dog, but I was very responsible. So <laughs> I waited until I had graduated um, college to get my first dog. And I picked my dog out like a really good dog owner. All my dog training friends know what I'm talking about and from a picture and went and grabbed him and didn't do any assessments at all and thought he was just the cutest thing and took him home and he had a ton of issues. <laughs> so uh, he had severe separation anxiety. He was what we call a bolter where he would just zip out the front door anytime he could and just go on a gallivant around town. What kind of breed was he? Uh, he, I, You know what? He's super old now, but I haven't done a DNA test and I need to, but he looks like he he looks and sort of acts like a papillon mixed with a sheltie okay so so he's small guy, about 15 yeah, 20 he, pounds or something yep, about 15 okay. pounds his name is fox if i didn't mention that with an um, f or a ph it's with an f it was a placeholder name <laughs> i was like i'm just gonna <laughs> call you fox until i think of something better and it stuck so that's his name um and he was eight months when i uh, uh rescued him whatever adopted him so um, he was right in a difficult stage, which we're going to get to talk about later. But, um, and he had all these issues. I mean, I don't know really what his history was or anything like that, but he, he, had, he had some issues. And, and um, it was, you know, my, my thought was, oh, um, I'll just fix his issues. Like, no big deal. <laughs> and I hired a trainer and worked with a trainer and um, had, a, had a pretty difficult time managing him. And to the point that, I couldn't fix a lot of his behaviors, so I was having to pay someone to be with him at home mm. while I worked. So all of my paycheck was going to babysit my dog. Um, so I thought this is BS, and um, I probably should have asked you if I can curse on here. You or can not. curse. Oh, that is <laughs> freeing. Um, bullshit. Anyway, it was yeah. bullshit. Okay. okay. <laughs> So, um, yes. So, um, I thought to myself, this is not going to work and, um, accounting degree be damned. I need a job that, um, I can take my dog to work with me because he can't stay home alone and he's costing me too much money. So that's actually what got me where I am today because I thought to myself, oh, I should work at a daycare. And there was a brand new dog daycare opening up um, that was so new that there was opportunity for management and all kinds of stuff in downtown San Diego. And um, I was like, oh, great. I can definitely bring my dog to work. So flash forward, no, I could not bring my dog to work. He was not a dog daycare friendly dog. <laughs> but as it turns out, but by then I had um, fixed his problem. He could stay home. <laughs> he could stay home. A little damage to my house still, but he could stay home. So that's just got, kind of what got me into the dog education or dog care world uh, was Fox. Fox got me there. And um, since then, uh, I, I, I worked at this daycare for not very long. It, it didn't actually last very long. It, it, is, it is a difficult business to, um, to get into and be successful at. So um, it, that company didn't last very long, but before they, uh, kind of, you know, went on their own way, they partnered with a training company 
And I sort of mentored under the owner of that training company for a while. And I was super resistant to being a dog trainer. Um, but man, they sink your teeth into you. And I got really into it. And the rest is history. I, I, I had a lot of amazing mentors um, that I owe my entire career to and that took a chance on me in my beginning stages and taught me so much of what I know now. And mm -hmm. I got really lucky. And, um, you know, the only reason I'm not still with them is because I uh, needed a little more flexibility in my schedule when I had my first child. Hmm. So, so what, what, is, what is a, um, where, where does one go to get certified as a professional dog trainer and know, or is there like one governing entity that says stamp of approval on <laughs> what qualifies as a God. certified trainer? That is a great question um, that I get all the time. First, let me answer that last question, which is there like a governing blah, blah, blah. No, there are um, acceptable kind of certification programs. So I have my CPDT. And that is one certification program that is out there. It is not the only one. And there is no sort of overarching national regulatory board that regulates this. And I don't think there ever should be. Mm -hmm. There are so many different training techniques and methodologies out there. And the, I think that we are always learning what, what is the best method um, for dogs. I mean, it's a scientific practice. And so we're constantly... Um, as humans, always making new scientific discoveries. So it, there needs to be some flexibility in what method people choose to use with their dogs when training. So um, there is a faction out there that does want things regulated. I am not one of those. Um, I do not think that that would benefit the dogs. And so the other question, though, is then how do you become a certified dog trainer or whatever? And that is such a difficult question, but the only answer I know is how I did it, which is one, get yourself around dogs, get yourself around dogs. Like the best way to do that is to work at a dog daycare hmm. or uh, volunteer for a rescue because you, there's a lot of handling that needs to happen at like rescue sort of adoption events. And that's a really good way to get your hands on dogs, but you got to get your hands physically on dogs um in a safe way where people are mm. watching you so you can't right. so that's 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 number one and then number two is you need a mentor i don't know how to do it without a mentor i really don't so um and i don't recommend it because you need somewhere to start even mm. if you veer away from that methodology later on you got to start somewhere and throw yourself in to some type of methodology so that's the second thing and that is probably the place where everyone gets stuck because it's hard to find a mentor because it costs money. Generally, it costs money. Got it. The third thing is uh, research and educate yourself. And so um, I highly recommend getting certified in something simply because there is a whole education process that you have to involve yourself in in order to achieve those certifications. So maybe that's not the methodology that was perfect for you, but now you know everything about that methodology and you can move on to another one and get another certification if you want to. So mm -hmm. educating yourself, reading the books, doing the research um, on, on dogs and on different training techniques is, is probably the third thing. And last and final thing is putting in the hours, hands-on practice, because none of that book stuff, none, none of the hours you spend watching your mentor work um, it, they always make it look easier than it is are going to, um, yeah. are going to make up for actual hands-on experience training dogs. So you got to get your own dog. <laughs> um, and then you gotta, you gotta work with your friend's dogs and you have to find a place that is going to let you practice. And one of the great places for that, I think is, uh, like either like the humane society or like a rescue because those dogs always need mental stimulation and it's a good place for you to if you're doing it appropriately and, and, and um, fairly, that uh, those dogs could definitely use some, some loving, some obedience loving. Okay, so let's, um, <laughs> let's transition a bit into, you know, how you train dogs and or what are the, you know, how, how, the, how the approach to training dogs changes or adjusts or evolves based on the dog's 
life stage. So maybe what makes makes sense is you know we talked earlier about four four life stages or so. So um, maybe it would help if if you kind of identified first those four stages, and then we'll jump right into the first one and what you know a training approach or the most important things to uh, think about in in that first life stage, the puppy stage. Okay. Yeah. So um, first, let me say that there are multiple stages, but we're going to focus on what the, the four that I think come up the most with my clients. Um, and the first stage is the human bonding stage, and that's from seven to 12 weeks. So if you think about it, most of us that get puppies, get them at eight weeks, between eight and 10. So mm-hmm. we're getting them right in that um, period of time, and it, that's not a mistake. We get them during that period of time because that is the time that they're going to bond to their people between seven and 12 weeks old. That stage is, is, I got the most important stage, (laughs) the most important stage, um, it, uh, you know, for you. And, and here's something I want to say about this stage before I give you some advice is it is very easy to just hang out in that stage and be like, "Mm, I'll get started with everything when my dog is fully vaccinated. Or "Hmm, I'll get started with everything when my dog's not such a baby anymore, right? Because most of the obedience classes out there start at four months. Hmm. But that is not the best time to start your training. I mean, if you haven't yet, for God's sakes, yes, do it. But if you have a dog at eight weeks, start their training, start their training at 10 weeks. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say when you have a dog that is that, is that age is people are always asking me like, how young can I start training? Like start training at eight weeks, start training right when you get your dog. They love it. They love training. It's obviously a positive only approach at that age, but, um, there's, your dog is going to learn everything. They're little sponges, especially Mm. at that age. They're so motivated and um, they're, they're fresh. So you have the ability to really imprint some knowledge on them at that age. The most important thing is the socialization. So between eight and 12 weeks, I would say really eight and 10, if you really want to get in there, You really want to be socializing your dog. And that's, when I say socializing, I don't mean just with other dogs. I mean with other people, other in like new environments, sights and sounds and things, Mm. right? Dogs are so afraid of things like statues and balloons and dry grass. And like, you have no idea. It's it's insane. Um, And that is the time when you really want to be introducing them to all of those things. What's a little controversial about this is that most dogs are not fully vaccinated at that age. Mm -hmm. And I do get that question a lot about what is the risk that we're taking um, socializing my dog with other dogs at that age. Now, it's a risk. I'm not going to lie. And I'm not a vet, so I can't tell you like the numbers. But my belief is that the risk that your dog is going to get sick in an appropriately controlled social setting is lower than the risk that you're taking with your dog's personality and your dog's temperament for Hmm. their life if you do not put the work in at that early age and get them socialized. There's so, so, so what I hear you <laughs> saying is, is the most important thing in this phase is the social socialization, <laughs> which I really kind of understood as, as exposure to lots of different settings and other living creatures yeah. as well. But what about actual training? I mean, are you training them to sit yeah. and to, at the same time as well? Absolutely. So the, the, the fun things that you can kind of teach at that age are you can just start to teach a little tiny bit of, of, of obedience and therefore impulse control. There's not a huge um, expectation that we put on the dogs at that age, but it's more about fun learning. It's about, will you go under my leg to get this treat? I mean, that's where it all starts, right? If I put, pull my treat up, 
Will you pull your nose up? Does mm -hmm. your butt hit the ground? What happens when your butt hits ground? Oh my gosh, my treat releases. How fun. What a fun game, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, and and uh, starting there is going to make the rest of your life so much easier. doesn't mean you're not still going to have challenges later on, but it means that you set your dog up for success as mm -hmm. soon as you possibly could. Got it. I do want to tell you one thing um, for anyone listening out there that is like, oh, I got my new puppy and I'm going to go out to a party. And uh, look, I'm saying this because I did this. Before I was a dog trainer, I did this. I got the cutest bomber jacket for my dog, <laughs> for my dog, and I got him dressed up to go out, and we went to a concert. Oh my God, people are just plugging their ears right now. We went to a concert. Um, it was a little concert, and I swear to God, it wasn't, it wasn't that loud because how horrible is that? But I didn't know what I was doing, but I took him to a concert because I took him everywhere with me. And it was like people dancing. We were on the dance floor. I'm holding my dog on the dance floor. And I'm like, this is cool. This is what people do that take their dogs with them everywhere. So I just want to make sure people know not to do what I do. So you, if you're socializing your dog, the idea is to do it in a way that increases and promotes confidence around those things, not to increase and promote fear around those things. So if you have any um, question as to whether or not the socialization you're doing is going well, I do advise seeking out a professional um, because that is the stage when your dog is really imprinting everything they're going to know about the world and deciding what are they going to be afraid of and what are they not going to be afraid of. And that's why we socialize during that time because we want them not to be afraid of any of these things. So you have to um, be kind in how you introduce your dog and go at their level and, and not sort of push them into crazy things just because you're like, well, this is what I do. So this is what we're doing. Got it. So at, at pack method prep, um, first off, do you, you, you work with dogs at this life stage in the eight to 12 week? Yeah. Great question. So, we so what, actually, like what, if you could paint the picture of what someone would, would see if they had stumbled into uh, you know, dogs in this life stage yep. range, what would be going on at Pack Method Prep? Uh, we have a class called Pack and Play, and that is the only class that we have for dogs at that age. It's not appropriate for dogs that young to be going to like a daycare all day. That's going to tax their, um, it's going to tax them too much and therefore tax their immune systems. Mm. And that's not going to be very helpful for them. So they need a lot of rest. So uh, I don't recommend that, but none of the daycares are going to take your dog until they're usually until they're fully vaccinated, which is usually around four months anyways. So, um, so instead we have a, a socialization group class. There are a thousand positives and one negative to a socialization group class. Cause I know that there are some other places that do this as well. A thousand positives are all the things that we just talked about. Your dog is learning to interact with other dogs. You have a guide there that teaches your dog how to be respectful and, and teaches other dogs how to recognize signals and you get to start your obedience, which is fantastic. And of course, the humans get educated on all things puppy. The one downside of socializing your puppy in a group class format like that is that it is essentially the blind leading the blind. There's a bunch of misbehaving, rude puppies playing with a bunch of misbehaving, rude puppies. So in a perfect world, this will never happen, unfortunately, but I mean, because we'd have to charge so much money. But in a perfect world, your puppy socialization would have, maybe there's another puppy, but their main socialization would be with well-socialized, um, appropriate in their corrections, if, if they need to give any, adult dogs. Hmm. Because those are the dogs that are going to teach your puppy how to be a well-socialized, appropriate adult dog. Hmm. Another puppy, like your puppy's going to go up and get, be like, oh my God, let's get crazy. Let's, right. get, let's get fucking wild. And the other <laughs> puppy is not going to be like, you know what? No, because other dogs are not going to like that behavior. <laughs> no, the other puppy is going to be like, yeah, you know, like just like egg right. in the mud. So <laughs> that's kind of what happens in group class. So it's a little, uh, when I say the blind leading the blind, it's not the trainer is not the blind one leading the owners that maybe are, but it's the dogs. The dogs are the blind leaving. leaving the so, so in a perfect world, every puppy would have its, its own adult mentor. Yes. 
Yeah, now you said something interesting, which was that you know an adult dog is going to be helping socialize a puppy. So, what does that behavior look like? Maybe I just haven't witnessed that enough myself. So, how would a you know if I bring in a, my little puppy? Let's say my little puppy is a German Shepherd, and Oof. Um, there was a, uh, a a mentor dog who was you know four or five years old, very well behaved socialized who was a I don't know some sort of a uh 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 a spaniel or a, a border oh, collie okay. for example what okay. what would that <laughs> what what would I witness okay 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 yes I see that I've left something out the the adult dog has to be okay with their job as <laughs> they have to be uh, okay with it they, they 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 have to not hate puppies <laughs> So there, there we're, we, we're, we are going to talk about this when we talk about that life stage that those adults are in. But there are adult dogs that are um, <clears throat> uh, in incredibly um, intolerant of rude behavior. It doesn't make them bad dogs at all. It makes them totally normal. But they are not about teaching a dog. So if you put those adult dogs around a puppy, then your German Shepherd is just going to get his ass beat on a regular basis just like <laughs> but the problem with the breeds that you described is that um i mean i don't know these dogs and i don't you know but right. if you put a large breed puppy with a smaller breed adult the adult may not have the power that it needs to teach a, a proper lesson so it is about choosing the right mix as okay. well. As so let's say it was, you know, a golden, a golden retriever puppy and a, and a well-socialized, mature, patient, golden retriever yes. um, adult who, who was okay and did agree, <laughs> and signed, signed on the dotted line that, yes, I yes. would like okay. to be a mentor to, to another yeah. golden retriever puppy, but wasn't so, related by blood. Yes. I love it. I love all that. And they could be related even. Yeah. I love all of that. So um yeah yeah that makes it easier <laughs> i bet you didn't anticipate that the breeds would just so many things easier. to think about yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> um yes so in that case we've taken out a lot of factors to consider in that case what you're looking at is uh, it, it, um, for an adult dog to be a good teacher they do have to have a certain level of intolerance to rude behavior because that means they're going to identify the rude behavior that is a bit over the top and they're going to correct the dog themselves and so it could be as simple as giving a growl. It could be as simple as giving a hard stare, or it could be as not simple, um, but really simple for dogs as giving an actual bite. Um, we have students, and, and I would rather that puppy um, get bit by an adult dog that has an appropriate bite inhibition. They know exactly how hard they're biting and they're only using what's necessary than to get attacked by another dog at the dog park who mm -hmm. doesn't have the same bite inhibition because that puppy never learned its manners. And so that's something that we're always considering um, during our socialization. And if we do have a young buck that comes in for um, school and, we can, and they're extremely rude socially, we have a sit down conversation with the owners about the likelihood that their dog is gonna get bit in the face. <laughs> And it's a realistic, you know, conversation about this is probably going to be good for your dog. Um, and this is, of course, not something that I recommend owners to do because I'm a professional. I know that what this adult dog that I have around this puppy is capable of. Mm -hmm. I know that they never go over the top. I know that... Um, that every puppy I've ever put around this adult has been better for it. And that's how I know that this is the right adult mm. to put around this puppy um, and that they're very fair with their judgments. So it is something that if you know your dog really well, then you could probably make that assessment. So like if it's your adult dog and then your new puppy and you've had your adult, especially golden retrievers are, they're kind of, um, they're actually kind of infamous for being really good teachers. Hmm. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of golden owners out there that had papa dogs or mama dogs that were good teachers. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. So we 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 went down a little bit of a rabbit hole in the in the in the puppy stage. So mm-hmm. we have this life that life stage of pup. So what 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 is the life bonding. stage that? Mm-hmm. We have eight to twelve. It's the seven bonding. to twelve weeks human bonding stage. That's where you want to do your socialization and start your training. Got it. And what, what is the next stage after that? Next stage is next stage is the adolescent phase. So nobody likes this phase. Nobody likes it. It's from four to eight months. And this is when your dog starts acting like a bratty teenager. This is when they change from you being like, sit, and they're like, oh my God, sure, what a fun game, to you being like, sit, and they're like, yeah, but what if I don't? And just... <laughs> what are the boundaries? Then, what yeah. line can I cross? What line can I cross, and what will happen when I cross it? I, would, I really want to know that. And if you aren't prepared with your answer, if you aren't prepared to be like, oh, because <laughs> that's what happens to most people, I, I feel like, is they, their dog turns four months, or five months, or six months, and then suddenly is like a total a-hole and their dog asks them that. The dog says, well, what if I don't? And they're just like, oh shit, like no one's ever, what? You're not going to do it? What do you mean? You've always done it. You know, and they, they're kind of at a loss. So, so luckily though, training usually starts right then. So if people are super on top of it and if they've had their dog since their dog was young, then um, that's when training usually starts right around four months. That's when the group classes usually, that's like kind of their lowest age. When the group classes start, that's when we start taking dogs into prep school is at four months of age. Um, They are, one of the reasons why you can start training at that age is because they're mentally capable of, of not just learning, but they're mentally capable of accepting boundaries. Hmm. And that's really, really important. Although they are now pushing against those boundaries at that age, it is acceptable now for you to push back. So when they're much younger, under 12 weeks, you have to be really careful with how in, much you're enforcing mm. um, because uh, they're in that stage where everything sticks, right? Everything, uh, uh, if, you know, if you accidentally give them a negative experience by, you know, um, you know, I don't know what you could do, but like snapping your fingers or something like that, then it's, ah, now it's stuck. But that's not what you're dealing with, with four to eight months. They can handle a lot more at that age. And, um, and that's when you want to start sticking to your guns. So you take them to obedience class, you set up a good routine at home and you uh, provide extreme consistency in your responses. That's what you want to do in that age. Hmm. And so what does a good routine look like at home if someone is trying to do this and get it right at home versus at, at a school? So first I'd like to say any behavior that you don't want them doing to a stranger, they shouldn't be doing to you because it is very difficult for your dog to differentiate between I can do this with my family and I can't do this with the neighbor kid, for example. Um, so things like jumping is a big one. Um, those if you haven't already started to push back against those and set clear boundaries and expectations, now, now is the time. So one thing that I really like to start putting in place at that stage is a program that has many names. I was taught that it was called Work for Love. It's also known as Pay to Play or Learn to Earn, I think is another one. There's so many names for it. But um, I, I was mentored with Work for Love. So that program teaches your dog that everything they love in life, they now don't get for free. They hmm. now have to earn um, those things that they love. They have to work for it. And the work that they do for it could be anything as simple as doing a sit. So, and the things that they love could be anything, meaning things we know our dogs love. Treats. Great. That's easy. What else do they love? They love it when you put your, their food down. They also love it when you open the back door for them to get out. They also love it when you let them jump into the car and go to the park with you. Hmm. They love it when you put their leash on. They love it when you throw the ball. They love it when you let them up on the couch. So those are all things that should also go on that list and that your dog should now be having to earn through obedience work. So those are all opportunity points for obedience tasks such as sit 
down, down. tricks. Weight. Yep, Shit. tricks. Shape. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I should have asked this before, but at Pack Method, at Pack Method Prep, what are the what? What's the biggest group of dogs that you have? What life stage are they at? We uh, six months. Okay. <laughs> we get a lot. We we we. I think majority of the dogs that start with us start between four and seven. They start around between four and seven months. Um, and then our program is three to six. Uh, is like the basic three to six months, sorry, is the basic okay. of the program. So they're with us for three to six months. And so what would someone notice walking into pack method prep on a, on a, on a typical day? And there's a group of this sort of age dogs doing their thing or, or being in school, what would someone see? Okay. <laughs> um, so when your dog is in the puppy stage, they're pre they tend to be Although they have a hard time maybe paying attention or whatever because they have uh, because they're young and they need a lot of rest and they get distracted easily, they're not um, they're not oblivious to you. They just want to do what's fun. And so if you make yourself fun, they're into it. That's at the puppy stage. In the adolescent stage, man, making yourself funner than their buddy their buddy dog friend or um, then that ball that's being thrown across the beach is, ex it becomes extremely difficult. Um, so in other words, when they're young, it's, Hey, let's do this. It'll be fun. When they're an adolescent, it's, Hey, let's do this. It'll be fun. Unless you don't do this, then it's not going to be fun anymore. <laughs> you have to have that other side. You have to be able to say, if you do this, like uh, if you come to me um, or if you sit, you're going to get a treat. And if you don't, we're going to leave. No more fun. Sorry. You only get to do these things if you're a good listener. <laughs> I so a what I hear you saying is they, <laughs> they, they want both sides of it. They want to work for the fun or? No, no, no. I, I, this, in other words, you have to make it. Uh, what I guess what I'm saying is they're just doing it for the sake of doing it is not something they're usually going to do anymore for you as an adolescent. There's going to have to be a consequence for not doing it in addition to the uh, reward for doing okay. it. Got it. Okay. That's what we're kind of seeing is that if, um, you know, like if I take an example, it's like, if my dog is like, you know, sees another dog and is like, oh, you're so fun. And they're a puppy. And then I'm like, oh, puppy, 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 look at me. They're like, oh, you're fun too. Versus an ad adolescent, it's like, oh, look at that dog. He's super fun. And I'm like, oh, puppy, puppy, puppy. And he's like, fuck you. That dog way more fun than you. I would never come to you, not in a million years. Like that's the attitude that you start to get. Like you're worthless, you know? <laughs> like I've seen you for the last three months. You mean nothing to me now. So a dog that a dog that 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 comes to the school, um, what are they like before and what are they like after? What are their capabilities? So we focus on basic obedience. It it is a basic basic obedience program, um, but we've made it long term, really long term. Obviously, it's six months, right? Most like if a, compared to like a boot camp that is usually two weeks, you send your dog away, get them back, they're trained. That's not what we do. We have this long term program because we are trying to. Uh, provide an overall sort of uh, foundational obedience and socialization, mental stimulation, everything training for the dog. So when dogs come to us, it does depend on what age, but when they come to us, usually they haven't had um, a lot of the reason that parents bring their dog is because there is something going on in their life that makes it hard for them to be as consistent and provide as much training for their dog as we would be able to do. So they come to us so that all day their dog is receiving a very uh, a routine structured day as well as getting their obedience in and their socialization and everything else that we have as you know desensitizing to things they're scared of and all that stuff. So um, one of the main things that we see is that by the end of the program, they're, they're not losing control of their dog just because there's a distraction. That's sort of a huge thing that we're working on every day. Because we train the, the dogs in packs around their friends, always around their friends, they're learning 
that training is training is training, regardless of the environment that you're in, it makes it really a lot easier for them to take their dog out in public, for mm. example. I would say too, let, let's say they uh, come um, at four months and then they stay for six months. A lot of people stay for eight months. I mean, but let's say they they come, their dog's four months and they stay until they're you know, six months old, or I'm sorry, 10 months old, which is a six month stint, they have just had someone helping them with the consistency of their dog through the worst stage of their dog's life, the hopefully the worst stage of their life, which is that adolescent phase where the dog is mm. constantly saying, no, I don't want to. And they have someone else helping them with that instead of it just being them. It's sort of like the torture that middle school teachers go through. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> the teachers can deal with your kid's bad attitude. <laughs> So what I hear you saying is, is a dog that's been conditioned at school is already around a lot of distractions in the form of other dogs. And so when they, are act when they are being disciplined in the presence of those distractions, it's almost like a higher level of conditioning. And so when they, they then go home or they're out in, in the public in a dog park, there's often less distractions than they have, have at school. And so the, 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 they're more receptive to the training or more responsive um, because they, they've shown that they've been able to do it in the presence of more distractions. Do I have yes. that right? Okay. Yes, that is the hope. The one, the one thing that can kind of get in the way of that is that if, if the owner is not able or willing to um, work and be consistent with the, with the same stuff that we're doing at home, then the dog can say, oh, at school I behave, but when I'm with mom, I don't. Mm -hmm. And so we do, we, we incorporate private in-home lessons into our program so that we are translating that information and getting that feedback to the parents so that they have something they can work on at and home. What, what does that homework look like for, for parents, for dogs in this second stage, <laughs> adolescent stage? As, an, as a parent, um, I don't like to assign a lot of homework per se. So what we try to do is we schedule our private lessons to happen after we've already figured something out with the dog. So our first, like a dog starts, let's say January 1st, their first private lesson isn't gonna be until three weeks later. That allows us some time to get some knowledge into the dog so that all we're really doing is saying, look, here's what your dog can do. All you have to do now is just do this at home too. And so that allows parents to be able to be a little bit more consistent with, a, with some support from us instead of having to have carry the heavy lifting of being a part of that education process. We can do most of the educating and they just uh, then can practice what we've taught their dog at home. And mm -hmm. of course, then we'll help them with, here's how we got your dog to be consistent. Here's what we already figured out, worked for your dog and got them to maintain their stay um, and here's what we figured out doesn't work for your dog so that they don't have to make the same mistakes. Got it. So I'm on your website now under the curriculum page and there's um, a bunch of rules to be taught. No jumping on people, no excessive barking, no potty inside, no corpophagia. Coprophagia. Uh, That's coprophagia. Poop. Coprophagia, which is what? That's poop eating. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, no eating poop. Yeah. <laughs> no Uno, talking about you. No resource guarding of people, food, toys, etc. No chewing destruction of inappropriate objects. No rushing, guarding, or crashing entrances. And no mouthing of people. Yeah. And yeah. so those would be all covered in the adolescent stage. So those, yeah, those are things that if your dog comes in with those issues, yes, most of, most of the dogs that have those issues are, in, are yes, in the adolescent phase. So yes, good uh, point. Okay. Uh, good point. But, and those are things that if your dog comes in with those issues, we are going to be helping helping them get rid of them. And therefore we expect that the owners will not be reinforcing those issues at home. And then there's a bunch of commands, come, drop it, heal, leave it out, release, sit, take a break. Yes. Down, mm -hmm. go potty, crate, look, place, settle, stay, touch, and more. Yeah. So. Those are what we consider our core commands. And so those are the things that we work on repeatedly every week, nonstop, over and over and over again. And we have designated levels for each command and dogs have to reach a specific level, what we call a milestone in, within each command. Mm. And when they've reached the majority of their milestones, that's how they earn a certificate. Got it. And get it on and get on the honor roll. That's correct. So what's the, what's after the adolescent stage? Okay. 
So there, this next stage is really important and it actually overlaps the adolescent stage. So adolescent stage, like we talked about, happens between four and eight, although some of you out there with 10 months old that think your dog is still in adolescent phase, maybe they are because I swear to God, it extends sometimes. So uh, four to eight is the typical adolescent phase. But there is this stage called the secondary fear stage hmm. that happens between six and 14 months. And this is something people normally do not know about. But what I can tell you is that your dog, your beautiful, sweet baby, is suddenly going to be a Cujo. That's what happens in this fear stage. So especially if you have a dog like a shepherd, for mm. example, they tend to be quite sensitive to their surroundings and they're quite vigilant. And um, any dog that was bred to protect, they are, they, they are uh, vigilant dogs as well. And those are the dogs that are going to uh, be most affected by this fear stage, in my experience. Um, and what this could mean is that suddenly your dog starts uh, barking ferociously on leash when people pass by. Mm. Maybe it starts with it with at night, and then maybe it starts happening during the day too. Um, I see this. I, I like to use German Shepherds as an example because I see this so often in someone who's not prepared for this fear stage, or maybe isn't as uh, educated in this breed that right around six, um, seven, sometimes eight months, their German Shepherd starts acting, su at, I'm going to put quotes around aggressive, because it's not really aggressive. They're being reactive. They're mm. scared and they are reacting. Um, but what, will, what can happen, let's talk about what happens if we're doing things wrong by mistake, would be that we do think our dog is being aggressive and we start secluding our dog more and more and more instead of sort of doubling down on the socialization, the structure mm -hmm. and the uh, positive association and all of that stuff that we could be doing. So this is something really, really common. Unfortunately, we had a whole lot of four months old, four month old start at school at the same time. <laughs> so now we have a bunch of fear stage dogs all at school at the same time. And they all just spooking each other right and left, barking at the window and being all, you know, again, in quotes, aggro, which is they're not, but, you know, being little, little scaredy, little scaredy punks. You kind of have to imagine it like in this stage, they are trying to figure out what it's like to be a grown up, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're starting to put a little confidence in themselves, but at the same time, suddenly everything is scary that necess wasn't necessarily scary before. So now they're scared and they have a little piece of confidence and that's where you start to see this reactivity. Hmm, interesting. And so what, yeah. is the, what is the response or the, the way to um, help them grow and, and yeah. effectively through that stage? Number one, don't freak out. Don't freak out. So that's, that's so important because they're already freaking out. So you can't freak out, <laughs> you know, your emotion and, um, what, what, how you sort of, uh, react to their reaction, um, makes a huge difference to them because these dogs, the ones that are the most affected by the, um, by the fear stage are also tend to be the most sensitive. And the ones that are the most sensitive are the most in tune with you emotionally. They're mm. the most connected to their human. Um, and that's why I use German Shepherds as an example, because th those are, I mean, one of the most loyal and um, bonded breeds out mm. there. And so if they go, oh, that's scary, wow, 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 wow. And then you go, oh my God, what's wrong with you? No, <laughs> like this, you just said to them, yeah, that is scary. You're scared of them, <laughs> but they don't know that. Right. They think you got all freaked out. All they can read is an emotional, an intense emotional response. And they think that the same thing that freaked them out is now freaking you out. And so it's really important to keep your cool. If you know that the fear stage is coming, I think it's easier to do that. So keep your cool, number one. And number two, um, be proactive. Be proactive about, oh, you're afraid of people? Sweet. Let's go out and at, at a, you know, appropriate distance, because I'm not trying to freak you out, let's start uh, building a better positive association with these people. Instead of feeding you out of your bowl, I'm going to feed every scrap every time you see a person on a walk. Oh my God, there's people. Here's five kibbles or, you know, here's a squeeze of your raw food. Okay. 
um, that build that positive association and be proactive about combating the fear. That's the second thing. And then the third thing is structure. Again, um, they, the dogs that are the most susceptible to this are also the ones that need structure the most, that rely on it the most. And when a dog is scared, they can feel like they're on shaky ground. And the more that you can do to provide firm, confident footing uh, through structure and consistent expectations, the more calm they're going to be because they're going to be like, oh, this lady's got it. Mm -hmm. She runs a tight ship at home. There is no way anyone out here is going to throw her off her game. That's what those dogs need to know from you. And running a tight ship essentially means setting rules at home and sticking to them. It's that simple. Got it. And so you called this stage the, the fear stage? This is the second or? fear stage. The second. The first one happens when they're super, super, super young. Um, and usually people, usually people don't really have their dog, um, yet. Okay. And so we're talking about six to 14 months now is this third stage, right? Correct. For the adolescent. Yep. Okay. And so what I heard you say was, you know, dogs are going to be afraid they're, they're, they're scared. And the answer is not to be scared because they're scared. That's just, uh, you know, a, a downward death spiral, but <laughs> yeah. rather to, um, you know, be patient with that and understand what, that it's a phase that they're going through and to keep them acclimated and exposed and even to incorporate rewards into, um, into them being exposed to some of those things, those triggers that are, that are getting them scared in order to increase their comfort level and kind of get through that phase. Yeah. Yeah. Doubling down on, you know, correcting them in the moment when they're having a fear response is really not, is not the way to go. And it is an instinct that people have because they think their dog is acting out and they think that's the time to set a boundary, but it isn't. The time to set boundaries is at home and any other time other than right when they're in the moment of having a fear response. That is the time when it's about management and it's about um, uh, um, redirection. Um, and, but I do want to be clear that this is when they are in this fear stage. So later in life, correction during that phase, maybe during that moment may be warranted, but I, I do not find that that is very helpful, um, when they're in the second fear stage. Got it. And so what's after the, this third stage, the okay. fear stage. So this is the last stage we're going to talk about. And this is the stage everyone is like, Oh, I am out of the woods. Like, <laughs> Somebody out there was like, once your dog is three, this is what I was, and then, I mean, I'm like somebody out there, me, I told everybody this. Um, once your dog is three, you're good. You're good to go. You, you know, if you could just really commit to your training for three years, which seems like a lot, but within the span of the life of a dog, it's really not right. If you can just really commit to your training for three years, you're going to have the best freaking dog. And it's not just your training, it's your socialization, your exercise, the whole thing. Like give your dog everything for three years and then you can just chill. Now that is true. It is true. Depending on when your dog's last stage hits and how it affects them. So the last stage is the maturity phase and the maturity phase happens between one and four years. I, my experience has been that it affects dogs the most between one and a half and two and a half, which makes sense because that's right in the middle. Um, this, this to me is your dog turning from a 20 year old into a 30 year old. <laughs> so the, the example that I always use, so I'm going to use it again now is like when you are, um, you're in your twenties, you're feeling yourself you haven't had enough life experience to be messed up in the head yet. You're going out to the clubs. It's not gross. The music is popping and you're having a great time with your friends and everyone's wasted and spilling drinks. And the next day you're going to be hung over and who cares? Okay. So then you're in your thirties suddenly, all of a sudden, and clubs are disgusting. They're the worst. They're the, your worst nightmare. And you now, for fun, hang out at home and you're either by yourself because this is the only time you get to be by yourself 
or you're with like two friends binge watching Netflix. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's a drastic change. It's a drastic change. And so going through the maturity phase for a dog to me is going through that change. And what I tend to see a lot, um, there's a number of different things. First of all, your dog could start acting like an adolescent again. That's something that could happen during that phase. Just hang on, go back to some training. Everyone's usually given up by tra on training by two years old because they're like, I'm done. But if your dog starts acting out again, just start training again. And you, you should be able to ride the wave and get through the adolescent phase. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the maturity phase. Um, however, there are some dogs who, who really go through a, 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 a prominent change, like what we just described. And I do see that this, ha I, I find that this happens more with female dogs than, than male dogs that go through such a significant change, where they could be going to a daycare since they were four months old, and then they turn one and a half, and they suddenly are trying to eat dogs' faces off. And what I have found is that they are just changing, and they no longer want to be at the club. Hmm. And that's the club. And it doesn't mean they're a bad dog, and it doesn't mean something's wrong with them. It just means that they're, um, they have changed. And they're over they're it. Like, yeah, they are so over it. They're so over it. Um, so I do get a lot of calls about dogs going through the maturity phase that are no longer tolerant of puppies. And that's super, super common. And who cares? Puppies suck, is what I would say. <laughs> who cares? Puppies suck. So then don't put your dog around puppies because puppies suck. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would say. Got it. Um, so the, really the, the, the action for an owner in this stage is to honor the stage that they are at and recognize that it might be a time to reinvigorate some of that training that was going on and just recognize that, okay, I'm not dealing with a, a club hopping um, puppy anymore or pub, club hopping adolescent anymore. I'm dealing with a more sophisticated um, gentleman or lady who wants perhaps a more uh, low-key or simplified existence. Absolutely. 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 Okay. And um, we also talked about rescues. Yeah. Okay. So what do we yeah. do with rescues? So, <clears throat> so when we're talking about rescues, Really, you could be rescuing your dog at any one of these stages. Um, it, it just it depends on the age of the dog you're rescuing. But I think that regardless of the age, so let me say first, it is important that you understand these stages and that you're taking that into consideration anytime that you are working with your dog or choosing mm -hmm. a dog. So for example, if you choose a dog when they are five, if you are rescuing a dog when they're five, that dog and not going through any more developmental changes, you are not going to have to worry about any of that. So you can just work on what they got going on because no hormones are going to be getting in your way. <laughs> so that's one nice thing about rescuing adult dogs or senior dogs, especially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got two seniors right now. I don't know. It's going to be hard to get me to ever get a puppy. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so that's the good news. And another thing to know too, is that if you rescue a dog that's eight months and they are maniacs, you actually don't know if they're maniacs because they could just be going through a fear stage, an adolescent phase, you know, they could be right in the middle of the worst stage of their life. Hmm. So, um, seven, not eight, nine, ten 10 months, you just don't, you, you kind of have to, you know, just do your best because you don't know how much of it you're dealing with is hormonal and how much of it is just who they are. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, some of the things that I think are the most important though, regardless of the age of your, the dog that you're rescuing is, um, number one to have an understanding for how long it takes for dogs to acclimate to a new home. So, so, so important. Normally it takes between two and four weeks for a dog to acclimate to a new home. If your dog is super traumatized because of something or very under socialized in their past or whatever, and they, they are a little bit more special needs, let's call them, it can take two to four to six months. Hmm. So if you're looking at a meat trade dog, for example, you could be looking at a six month acclimation process. Wow. Yeah. Um, my, one of my rescues took 
Um, I mean, my eight month old was like, sweet, where are we going? Like, didn't take any time to acclimate. He's like, I'll pee all over this house. No problem. <laughs> um, but my other, my other rescue who was a bit more traumatized and came from a situation where she experienced some loss, um, took, I, I mean, close to three months to really mm. feel herself here and get some confidence. So, um, so it really doesn't matter. And why, why that stage is so important to recognize and to acknowledge is because during that acclimation stage, one, you can't really judge their behavior too much. So I've had people that are like, oh, I got this new rescue. She was so calm for the first week. And then the second week came and she's a monster. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, she was probably in shock the first week. Like, you shouldn't have taken that too seriously, <laughs> you know, especially if someone's like, oh, I adopted this border collie mix and she was so calm the first day. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that was a fluke. That was a lie. <laughs> you got a border collie. You should have known better. So that's one thing is maybe they're not as good as you think. I mean, from a personal experience, <laughs> we, um, when I was a young, the first dog that was my family dog, we rescued just from the pound. We just went there grabbed this dog and she was like super sickly. <laughs> mm. And so she was real calm because she was real sick. And we didn't know how sick she was. We just thought she was super calm and sweet. And then we got her out of there, took her to the vet, turns out she was sick and she turned out to be extremely high energy. So mm. um, I'm not saying that all the dogs that are calm are probably sick or that they're gonna suddenly yeah. not be calm. But I think that you can't, you can't really assess your dog too heavily in the first one to two weeks. A lot the of unknowns. Side, yeah, a lot of unknowns. And the other side of that is also true. In other words, if your dog is experiencing a lot of separation anxiety, if they're peeing in the house, but the rescue told you they were completely housebroken, that they didn't necessarily lie to you guys. It could just be that your 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 dog is acclimating to your house and maybe they're just gonna pee in there three times and be done with it. And so it's not just don't think they're as good as they are. Don't think they're as bad as, as they're showing themselves to be in that first week either. Let's get them acclimated and then we can start dealing with what they have going on. I have a lot of daycare owning friends who won't even um, allow a dog to be temperament tested at their daycare until they have been owned for at least a month. Hmm. So um, because they know that that dog isn't going to be, you know, um, in the right mental state and, uh, that the owner doesn't even know their dog well right. enough to know if, you know, how they're going to be in that environment. A lot of, there's a stabilization period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one more thing in that is that while they're in their, their acclimation period, mm -hmm. you don't want to really go heavy on the social situations. <laughs> so, so this is something that everyone wants to do because, you know, they're so excited and um, they're so excited and they, they want to introduce everyone to their new puppy, right? And so they like go to happy hour, like the first day, oh and, I mean, yappy hour, right? Everyone knows, you guys know, um, like the first day that they get their dog. And so I, I don't recommend that. Um, I, I recommend getting your dog. I, I'm not saying keep your dog home closed in your bedroom for the first two weeks, but extreme situ situations like a yappy hour like having like thanksgiving dinner like <laughs> oh my god everybody meet my new puppy i brought home yesterday like right. it's really not the best for them until you've given them a chance to decompress hmm. makes sense um okay so so that's the acclimation period that's something i like everyone who has new rescues to to know about but but also to speed up their acclimation process you can do some things. And one of those things is to uh, create a bond and the other is to train. So to create a bond, you do that by providing some structure to their environment. I'm gonna say something here and I want everybody to listen up, okay? Regardless of how traumatized your dog is and how long their acclimation period is gonna be, you have one week to feel sorry for them. And that's it. That's it. I, I, 
I don't care how traumatized they are and um, how much they've been through. I mean, I care, obviously I care guys, but like it's, it is not beneficial to them at all for you to live in that feeling of sorrow. Mm -hmm. It is not beneficial for them. So if your dog has no trauma, then you have one week to coddle them and that's it. That's it. You got one week. <laughs> I'll give you that. A lot of trainers wouldn't even give you that. So you've got the one week to coddle them, the one week to feel sorry for them. And after that, it needs to be, you're fine. I've got this. We've got things under control here. And that's how you create the bond. Hmm. Okay. The true bond comes when you take control of the situation, you start to provide structure, like what we talked about with the work for love program. That's a good way to start providing structure for your dog. Um, and to present clear black and white expectations, like you don't come into the bathroom when I'm washing my hands. Not because I don't love you, but because it's important to have some boundaries. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, and then training is the, is the sort of last piece of, of creating that bond, Pre uh, uh, opening up the communication lines between you and your dog so that you can speak on common terms is what's going to make your dog feel safe, make, make them feel like they can communicate to you and that you are going to be able to understand what they're saying. Um, that's what training can do for you. Got it. Okay. Well, Zoe, we went through a lot of topics here. I think we, we yeah. covered all the, all the life stages here and all the things that a, an owner can expect in terms of the phases of development and personality changes that, that their, their dog might go through. So super, super helpful. Um, I definitely learned a lot. So cool. when it comes to um, pack method prep, how, do you, how can people um, work with you? I'm on your website now. What do folks, uh, how, do, how do folks usually... Um, get their dog involved? Yeah. So the first step would be to either fill out our contact uh, form, which is on our website at www.packmethodprep.com. Um, or you can email us at info at packmethodprep.com. And we can answer all your questions. So through my two companies, we have our preparatory school. We have a whole group class series from pack and play to basic to intermediate to advanced. And then we also have um, our private lessons, depending on if you maybe just need some more in-home instruction because you want to be more involved in your dog's training, or if you have an issue that isn't really resolvable in a group setting, that would be private lessons. So regardless of if you contact us through Zoe's Dog Training or Pack Method Prep, either way, it's going to come to me. So, um, you know, we're here to help. And what's the website for Zoe's Dog Training? Zoe'sDogTraining.com. And it's okay. Z-O-E apostrophe S. There is no Y on my name, guys. Okay. Zoe's Dog. But on the URL, there's no apostrophe, right? No. Z-O-E-S DogTraining.com. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on Instagram, you guys are at, at Pack Method Prep. Also on the website, PackMethodPrep.com. So Yeah. Our Instagram is super fun. We put stories on every school day. So I do highly recommend following the at pack method prep um, on Instagram for sure. And we're going nice. to be adding more content in, over the next year or two. Very nice. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners here? Oh, no. I think I can retire now. You guys now know. You know everything there is to know about dogs. You're good to go. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Zoe. Thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you.